what an awesome thing it is for me to work with extraordinary women who run the place where I work every day. And it is my greatest pleasure to now introduce that team to introduce the women that lead DC. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, during an interview in June at Google's DC headquarters, Mayor Muriel Blauser, Blauser was asked how so much innovation had happened so fast since she took office. She replied, the girls are running this city now. <laughs> We're lucky to have three of those girls with us today, and my fellow girls of the College Board and I feel lucky to introduce them. And actually, to tell the truth, before you guys, you girls, got here, we were talking about it. We, it's awesome to be able to be here and share this stage with you. Mayor Bowser inherited her political and community building ambitions from her father, Joe, who was an advisory uh, neighborhood commissioner and a longtime community activist. She got, also got her passion, his passion for everything DC. She's the seventh elected mayor, the second woman, the second youngest to fill the, fill the post. She spent eight years on the city council, but her command of the neighborhoods, the details, the culture, and the folklore of this city may have come from a more surprising place. The many summers she spent working on a tour mobile bus. I mean, think about that for a moment. Can you imagine better training to lead a city? With each time, a better understanding, each time you make the loop around Arlington Cemetery, hearing, I mean, can you imagine that that would be how you would master and build passion for a city? And can you imagine a couple of decades ago sitting on that tour bus and tapping the person riding next to you and saying, hmm, wow, that eloquent young lady may be mayor one day. And so she is. After college, she tried her hand at corporate life in Philadelphia. And after a short number of years, she realized that her true calling was to come home and serve the city she loved. And just a decade after her first election to her own advisory neighborhood commission, neighborhood commission she has reached the city's highest post. Building on her, parents' lessons, on her parents' lessons, her business acumen, the details of the city honed through summers telling story on that Tourmobile bus, she's built direct, meaningful relationships with her constituents, neighborhood by neighborhood, leader by leader, and bringing transparency and a sense of togetherness to this diverse and sometimes divided city. And Mayor Bowser has surrounded herself with a top-notch team, as you will soon see. And she's put education at the center of her plan to make this country's political capital also its opportunity capital. All of our students have the opportunity and the potential to excel, she said, and she's committed to turning that potential into, into a reality. She's expanding early childhood, broadening STEM education, partnering with higher ed, and bringing technology to low-income communities. All the tools and building blocks of opportunity. And she's not just a role model for young women, she's there staunch advocate. The partnership she developed with Howard University to establish the first technology and innovation hub will place special focus in drawing girls, especially girls of, of color, to technology fields. She's accomplished a ton already, and we can't wait to see what's next. Please join me in welcoming the mayor of DC, Mariel Bowser. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here this morning to introduce our second panelist, Metropolitan Police Department Chief of Police, Kathy Lanier. If you live in the DC area, you don't just know the name Kathy Lanier. You know the face, you know the story, and above all, you know the remarkable record of achievement. Like millions of others, I have followed with great interest and admiration the career of Kathy Lanier ever since she was named Chief of Police in early 2007. Next year will be her 10th year on the job at a time when Chiefs of Police of major cities usually last two, three, maybe five years at the outside. What this has meant for DC is radically decreased crime rates, including record low homicide rates, a police department that has radically expanded its use of social media, and other tools to build a culture of communication and trust, and a new nationally emulated model of partnership. 
partnership between law enforcement and citizens, between cops and the neighborhoods they serve, and between the protectors and the protected. Chief Lanier has said, policing isn't just about making arrests, it's about making connections. A vivid example of this occurred on October 26, when an officer under Chief Lanier's command helped defuse a fight between teenagers, not by asserting authority, but by challenging one of them to a dance-off. If you haven't seen the video, which went viral, Find a minute to do so. It's such a great moment of connection and its positive impact. Like today's other extraordinary panelists, Chief Lanier isn't content to just follow the same old patterns and expectations. Instead, she has challenged the city of Washington to play an active part in owning its future, and it's led to amazing results. Chief Lanier knows something about owning one's future, and I'm a little reluctant to talk about her personal story because she never wanted that to be the story. But Chief Lanier, if you'll forgive me, just for a moment today, its lessons are too powerful to ignore. So here it is in a nutshell. Raised by a single working class mother, pregnant at 14, a married high school dropout at 15, divorced at 18, worked as a secretary and waitress until applying to the police academy, primarily to afford her son's education, earned a GED, two bachelor's and two master's degrees, served as commander of one of the largest and most racially diverse districts in the city, commander of the Special Operations Division, and the first commanding officer of the city's Office of Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, appointed by Mayor Fenty as chief of police. I'm sure you'll agree that her story and her success makes her a role model for women just starting their careers and proves to girls with aspirations to succeed that no matter what challenges they face, opportunity is within their reach. It's my true honor to welcome Chief Kathy Lanier. Good morning. It is both a professional and a personal honor to introduce DC Public Schools Chancellor Kaya Henderson. It's hard to think of a better representative of what the College Board stands for and what we're working to achieve. For five years, Chancellor Henderson has been leading DC Public Schools. And as someone who has lived in the DC area for many years, I can say that we are so fortunate. Very few urban school districts in the country have seen as much improvement in those years as DCPS has. Just last week, we celebrated the announcement from the National Assessment of Educational Progress that DC showed significant increases in both 2013 and 2015, even while, sadly, the nation's overall scores declined. We're celebrating a new era in which growth in student success, graduation rates, teacher and parent satisfaction, and overall trust and enrollment in public education have become the norm. In large part, this growth is due to Chancellor Henderson's steady and courageous leadership. The daughter of a public school principal and herself a former middle school Spanish teacher in the South Bronx, Chancellor Henderson understands keenly that student success depends on great teaching. That philosophy guided her in her role as National Admissions Director and Recruiter for Teach for America and as Executive Director of its DC region. And it also guided her in helping bring great teachers into urban school districts as a senior leader at the New Teacher Project. As deputy chancellor, she led the development of a system designed to ensure that the head of every classroom in DC public schools is a dedicated, effective teacher. And those great teachers she helped recruit 
are staying at a rate of 92%. Chancellor Henderson is also making sure that opportunity is being delivered through challenging coursework. Just last month, we learned that the minimum number of advanced placement courses offered in every DC public high school will increase from four to six this year and from six to eight next year. Just one example of how the chancellor and her team are challenging all students to own their future. And on a personal note, I'm so pleased to introduce Chancellor Henderson because we were both mentored by an extraordinary woman whose powerful intellect, impeccable integrity, unwavering commitment to educational excellence, and results-oriented collaborative leadership left a lasting legacy in this city. Floretta Dukes McKenzie, served as superintendent of DC Public Schools for seven years in the 1980s, and she passed away earlier this year. People often said of Dr. McKenzie, they don't make them like that anymore. As it turns out, they do. We at the College Board so appreciate Chancellor Henderson's wisdom, guidance, and support as a valued trustee. Please join me in thanking Chancellor Henderson for her great work and for being with us today. Thank you again for being here. So, Mayor. Yes, David. As an American, to watch DC be a star <laughs> instead of a scar is an amazing feeling. Thank you. What, What's it like for you to be rocking? What's it like to have this rocking team? Tell me about it. Tell me what it's like to be succeeding in this way. Well, it's, um, it's a blessing, first of all. We went uh, across the city talking to Washingtonians about what was important to them. Uh, and definitely being able to go all across the region, the nation, and indeed go to other places in the world. And people are commenting on the progress we're making in Washington. Uh, it is so fulfilling as a person who's been born and raised here um, and have seen our city in highs and lows. Uh, so to really be able to lead the city at this time um, is a great honor for me. And so with all the progress that we're making and all the successes that we can count, uh, we are also in the position to invest um, in the challenges that remain. And that is uh, something else that sets us apart from a lot of cities. Okay, perfect. Do you do like a happy dance in the shower? Are you like, my life is awesome? <laughs> I've had a few happy dances. I'm glad to I've hear. I've had a few happy dances. Because if I were you, I'd be like out there. Speaking of dancing, Chief Lanier. <laughs> <laughs> Since you became chief of police, what are you proudest of? What accomplishments? You know, brag, there are brag a little. I'm asking you ladies to like brag <laughs> as much as possible. Uh, there are a lot of things that, uh, you know, that make me love getting up and coming to work every day and accomplishments that, that mean a lot to me. But I think the, the most important one was, I've been here 25 years, I came up through the ranks, and through my whole career, what used to just really be so crushing for me is seeing so many teenagers in the 90s and early 2000s that were victims of homicide uh, on our streets. And to see homicides are, are troubling anyway, but to see children, yes. and they really children, you know, shot and killed on our street, it was just the one thing that I thought if I could ever turn that around, um, that's the most important thing. And we focused our whole team on reducing juvenile victims of homicide four straight years. Uh, we invested in a lot of positive engagement with kids. We invested in family programs. We invested in non-traditional policing, mm. um, a little compassion with the people that we, we work with. And between 2008 and 2012, we reduced um, the number of juveniles' involvement in homicide, either as suspect or victim, 63%. Um, and so that, to me, is the most important. 
and the location of your happy dance is where? What, what, talk to <laughs> Sometimes me Sometimes I sit in my chair and just spin around. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I need one of those. Um, Kaya, I need to tell this audience, because education is a field I know to some degree of precision, that the, the two years or you know, over a more, longer period of time that these NAEP scores building on each other, where Washington DC's growth has led the country, is stunning, formidable, amazing. It is, um, it is a light where there is gray on the education landscape. I, I, I cannot overstate the significance, but on a, more, on a more tender note, guess which state, if we shall say it, or which let's institution? Let's say it, let's speak it. And I, let's I'll it. say state loud, shall we say okay. state? <laughs> of the states, which had the highest percentage of students signing up for FAFSA in this country? Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. <laughs> So, Chancellor Henderson, my dear friend, what are you doing? <laughs> Share the magic. How's, how's this NAEP growth? Your great head of college and career planning is here. How are you getting this kind of FAFSA completion? Teach us. So, you know, I feel really lucky because it takes a city to do um, what we're doing. And as the mayor said, um, we've had tremendous financial success in our city and over the course of three mayors have made big investments in education. You can't do it on the cheap. And my mayor has put the money forward, the political will forward to allow us to do bold and innovative things. We have amazing partnerships with the Metropolitan Police Department, the Department of Health, the Department of Transportation. Literally, we are all focused on ensuring that our young people get a great education because we know that if they do, their life outcomes can be significantly changed. And so, you know, what gets measured gets done. We were nowhere on the FAFSA radar screen until my amazing college and career awareness team sat down and said, well, if kids are not filling out the FAFSA, then they're really not going to college. So let's set a goal for every single high school and let's monitor weekly. And so weekly the high schools get calls saying where they are against their FAFSA goal. And in a year that took us to the number one position in the country. Um, we're forging huge partnerships and alliances, in fact, um, we're about to open a public service academy next year uh, where our young people will be trained to enter the police academy. And the intersectionality, first of all, when you go into the police academy, you make $60,000, That's right? right. <laughs> that, is, that is a great proposition, but you also have the ability to go to college and get that paid for and whatnot. And if you think about the intersectionality between you know, policing and communities, I think um, we can set an example for what that looks like by investing in our young people. Um, we have an amazing team of educators and we've done everything that we could to make sure that DC is the most attractive place for teachers to come and teach and stay. Um, we have a rigorous academic curriculum that is aligned to the Common Core, no two ways about it. Um, and so we're expecting more from our young people. Um, and then we've made it a real priority to engage students and families, to make school fun for students and motivating, a place where they want to come, and then to make sure that families have a clear way to help support their students. And David, what we have found in Washington is that people are voting with their feet. Yeah. Uh, so I don't, in six years of straight growth in our public schools enrollment, which is remarkable. remarkable. For a period of time when I was growing up in DC, families were not going to the public schools and this change is incredible. Yeah. And so we're, we're, just, we're just really grateful for I, it. I think one could say the combination of your three talents and work is reintegrating this city in a beautiful way. Well, we're schools. definitely trying. Mm. And uh, the, the, the program that the chancellor just mentioned about the police department, so it was a great way for us to train our kids mm. and make sure that they have a pathway to a good job, but we also need some good DC residents on the police force. Okay. This chief has to hire 300 police um, for the next four years, hmm. 300. Uh, and so when the chancellor and the police chief can combine with an idea uh, to interest our, our young people in, in public safety, that's a win-win all yeah. the way around. It's great. So given how well you're doing, Thank you. Many would advise I'll you. take you around with me. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Any day of the week, I'm yours. Okay. <laughs> At night, during the day. Anyway, I shouldn't go too far. <laughs> but some would advise you, don't rock the boat. 
You right. know what I mean? Kind of like you're grooving, keep going, steady with the ship. Yeah. But King tells us sometimes, why wait? Where would you say that you want to speed things up, that you want to break some glass or need a challenge light? Or where might you say, I want to slow something down? But where are you feeling about pace in your leadership? I feel like uh, I have to go fast every single day. Um, today is the first anniversary of my election as mayor. Yeah. And so already, uh, we have already gone through 25% almost of, of my term. Wow. And so it goes so fast. And so I don't, I don't think that we, we should go slow. I think we should go fast. Now, we have to be strategic, and uh, I have attracted a great team. There's some men that work for me, too. Okay, got it. Uh, uh, there, <laughs> I, I have a chance. A, I have a great uh, city administrator, and we're focused on our, you know, our budget priorities, and we were very successful in partnership with the council this year. Uh, we have a legislative agenda that's aggressive. Um, we're attacking homelessness, and we have a bold plan to end homelessness in our city. Uh, and I think that we always want to go faster um, with schools. And the chancellor has laid out a tremendous uh, strategic plan uh, that, that we are focused on, but she's also focusing us on how we're going to serve um, our boys of color, uh, who we know we need different interventions. You know, I was so excited about you coming mayor. Mm -hmm. I had my kids a month later. I was that. Okay. <laughs> Your anniversary is a big one for me, too. Chief, <laughs> Chief Lanier, um, speed. Bold versus safe. Where do you want to steer faster, break some rules, do some things, challenge some things? Where should we go more cautiously in your realm? So f for me, um, it is constant pressure every minute of every day for me to constantly try and make things better. Every day that we aren't improving the way we police or public safety or the safety for the people in the city, somebody potentially could lose their life. So the sense of urgency is every single day for me. Um, one of the reasons I go around to crime scenes uh, the way I do is mm. because I want every person who's injured or, or that is the victim of crime to be a real person in my head every day because that's just how critical it is. It is not numbers. It is not, to me, it's not about statistics and about numbers. It is about every day I have to strive to make sure we're doing better. And if I'm not pushing the envelope to do better every single day, People become victims because of that. So you never want to lose the image of what really happens if police aren't good. And they have to be good, and they have to be better every day. So there's the urgency for me every single day. Um, to slow things down, uh, the thing I love the most about what I've been able to do with policing uh, is infusion of new technology, right? Mm. Technology is, is just great for, for us. But it also is the single biggest challenge we have because technology has made the speed of change so rapid that to keep up with the speed of change that technology brings in policing is a huge challenge. So slow down the, maybe a little bit on the technology, <laughs> but keep the energy behind the, I'll work change on the that. force. <laughs> Chancellor Henderson. Um, so I think, um, you know, DC Public Schools has seen a lot of movement in a very short amount of time. In 2007, we started a very bold and aggressive set of reforms, and in eight short years, we've seen tremendous progress. But I'm mindful of how much change people can take at one particular time. And so we've tried to be thoughtful about how we keep, pe keep pushing people with a sense of urgency, but not overburden them so that they are chaotic and then paralyzed and can't move forward. Um, I am super worried about high schools. Uh, we've done a lot of good work on rethinking what our elementary schools and our middle schools look like, um, but really thinking differently about high school because I think that the model um, is not providing what we need. Um, I'm thinking a lot about uh, more time in school, and so um, we, the mayor has been tremendous in supporting um, an agenda around a longer school day and a longer school year, but we don't just want to add an hour. Let me clap for that. Except um, the kids are like, we don't want more time in schools. So the kids are not that's clapping. That's actually not true, right? What students I was are setting saying you up, to Kyle. us, thank you. <laughs> what students are saying to us is, 
Our teachers are better now. We're doing engaging projects like cornerstone projects. And then the bell rings and it's time to go. We need more time in school. And when students are saying that, and when students are willing to work harder to get at more rigorous content, then that means they're going to be prepared for when we send them to college and they've got to work hard for something. When it means that they'll be willing to stay more time in the library or whatnot. We're cultivating the habits that are going to make them successful in college. So really concerned about high school, really concerned about the amount of time that we spend with our students. Um, and for me, I mean, we have a goal that 90% of our young people will love school. And for us, that means big investments in art, music, PE, foreign language, library. It means teaching second graders how to ride bikes so that they can understand social studies integrated with physical education in completely new ways. It means project-based learning. It means more athletics at a time when I feel like um, the country has been stripping these things away from public education. I actually think these are the things that give us um, the great kinds of young people who are ready then for college and career. So I'm bumming because we have about 10 more minutes and I have three questions I really want to ask. So we'll make Speed this round. kind of a light, <laughs> lightning round. First question, 1994, my mom stars front page the New York Times Magazine as Stalin leading Bennington College. She's provoked a lot of turnover. The article begins by describing how she walks and then describing how she was not sufficiently warm to the reporter by not inviting him to sit with her. Mm -hmm. So I've observed media and women leaders in my life and I find it super strange. Uh, I have many more thoughts on this, but I'm curious how you see it. What's been your interaction with the media? Is that still true today? Do you find strange preoccupations with aspects of you that would not be true of men? I'll let Kai and the chief answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> ah. I mean, chief, you want to? Oh, I'm so glad. You know it's a good question when the mayor passes. <laughs> I, I tell you, if you, you know, I've never let it you know, get to me. But to, to consider how women um, are perceived uh, in powerful positions. Yes. And Kai and I have been through this together, I know, and, and now the mayor as well. But when I was named as the nominee for the chief of police in 2007, I had two master's degrees, 17 years experience. I had run every division in the police department to include the special operations division and planned a, president, a couple of presidential inaugurations. And the headline on one of the big stories about my nomination um, in a major uh, newspaper was teen welfare mom tapped to be nation's top cop. Um, to talk about unfair, there was not anything in that article about my education, my experience, or, you know, that. And then Kai and I together, um, have been constantly uh, criticized for the salary that we make. And in both of our cases, people in the borders right around us make more money than we make in jobs with smaller organizations and a lot less responsibility. And nobody seems to think a word about it because they're not women. So we still have a ways to go. We've made it to the boardroom, so to speak, but the acceptance for us in the boardroom is not there. Well, after that lead, ladies, what else you got? Amen. Come on. Right. Yeah, I, I would say um, I've run, this is my fourth election. It would be my sixth, the last one, the sixth election, if you count my ANC elections. And I never really focused on how people treated me as a fee, female candidate until the last one. <laughs> um, and I think it for the, I uh, would be, and some people would say I was sensitive or I was thin skinned, Tom Sherwood, <laughs> or they would say, uh, uh, but the one I liked the most is they would say, I didn't understand or what she was trying to say or she hasn't done anything important. Uh, so I was attacked for my intellect, which I had never experienced uh, in, in my entire life. And so I thought that that was a, a interesting, um, it was an interesting attack. Now that I'm mayor, I think there's some other subtle ways that my gender comes in because people um, comment on how tough 
and aggressive in, <laughs> in, 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 in I am because I think they were expecting something different. And I tell everybody, my job at City Hall is not like going to a tea party. It's nothing like it. Um, and I do politics. And um, because I'm able to, uh, to be successful politically, the chief and Kaya and all the people that work for me uh, can do the important job of changing policies and moving bold initiatives. So I never make apologies for being a smart politician. And I think that some people expect women to play the game a little differently. Wow. You're good. I'll tell you, just because you've been so kind to me, Almost every day on Twitter, if you're having a bad day, you can Google my name and okay. someone's saying something nasty about okay, me. Okay, there's no worries. And my, my mother, who I've talked about too much, and I love my father too, but my mother said to me, you know you've arrived when you're not a devil, but the devil. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but then there, there are some um, su surprisingly um, things about us being women leaders and three women leaders. I just turned to the chief when Kaya was being introduced, when um, I think the Sunday after I was sworn in, we were all together or meet the press. Yes. Um, and uh, this is not the first this, or the second invitation yeah. that we've gotten to speak uh, yeah. together. Uh, and so it is, re it is unusual, yeah. we found. Uh, I think there was only one other city where yeah. there were three women who yeah. were in the positions um, that, that, we were, that we are in. Uh, and it is important to the girls. Yeah. Um, it's important to the boys, too. Yeah. But I, I like to tell this story that when I, I go around, when I was on the campaign trail, I was blown away um, by the number of children uh, that were paying attention to a mayor's race. Uh, they knew who I was. They knew what we were talking about. Uh, they definitely love to see the chief and her four stars come <laughs> in the room. They know. Um, and so if we can get the eight-year-old girls to vote, uh, we'll, we'll be here for a long time. We can do better on our <laughs> As a middle-aged white man, we're finished, folks. It's over. <laughs> Zach and Scarlett, right. back to me. <laughs> I have a boy and a girl, they're 11 months old. I'm getting a river of blue and pink stuff. What do I do, ladies? Like, if I don't want Scarlett to be framed necessarily in pink dresses from her earliest days, what's your advice to me? Do I give it back, let her wear she, what she wants? What's your guidance on raising my daughter to be as awesome as you? Well, I love pink. <laughs> so uh, I think she should wear what she wants. <laughs> is that the uniform? <laughs> yeah, I, I think the best thing a parent can do is support and encouragement. Yeah. Gender neutral support and encouragement. <laughs> that's really what makes the child survive and thrive is just support and encouragement because kids will get on and off track. <laughs> when a lot of things, teenagers really on and off track. Parents, support and encourage. <laughs> I got to change my whole plan then. <laughs> I'll Hi, echo that sentiment. I grew up with people saying to me, you know how smart you are? You could be the president of the United States one day. And I really believed that, right? Yes. And when I think about even the work that we do every day in DC public schools, for a long time, the narrative was, we're the lowest performing school district in the country. Well, who wants to hear that, right? right? The truth <laughs> of the matter is, we're now the fastest improving urban school district in the country. And my educators and my students now have a different sense of possibility. So we speak possibility and opportunity um, into our young people's lives. And so what you speak into Zach and Scarlett's life will absolutely determine determine their trajectory. How worrisome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, we're in our concluding moments. You have assembled before you approximately 2,000 people. They are the membership of the college board. They're leaders in higher education and K-12. They're school counselors. They're nonprofit organizations. They lead in areas like financial aid, admissions. They lead in areas like teaching and advanced placement. What would you ask of this audience? I think this audience is ready to follow you. So what can we do to accelerate your work? Well, I would thank them uh, for all of the work that they are doing for young people. And to Kaya's point, pay attention and watch the students in, in Washington, D.C. We are raising our expectations about what they can achieve. And we know when they leave our schools, they're going to be prepared. Um, they haven't always been prepared to be successful at college, but we want to raise our expectations, hold all of our staff um, accountable for helping the students achieve 
those expectations. We want to wrap our city services around them so that they're best prepared. Um, but I would just ask everybody to pay attention to Washington. We're producing some really great students who can go to any college anywhere in the United States. And um, we're going to be there to support them while they're there. Chief Lanier. So um, although I get a giggle out of the three girls and when we get when we go places, uh, think of this group, this administration, for, the, for what they are. It is a mayor that is committed to making sure everybody has the same access to everything that everyone should have quality education, good safety and security in healthy neighborhoods, and success in one of the biggest, most powerful cities in America. So support those ideals and those efforts and support this administration's efforts to get there. DC has one of the largest wealth inequality gaps in the country, and yet and still, uh, we are producing significant results. So it doesn't matter what challenge you have, you can do it too. We will partner with you, watch us, but call us. We'll tell you what we're doing, we'll help you. Um, hire our students, get our students into your schools. If you're a state school, they come with a $10,000 tag grant, um, so they're very attractive. Um, but um, we hope, we expect um, that our position in the nation's capital means that we should be a national example for what a great city can look like, for what healthy communities look like, and for what um, a functional and exceptional urban school district can look like. And so we look forward to working with you um, on that. And uh, just Chief Lanier, I think you raised such a beautiful thing that I want to conclude with it. Chief Lanier said is don't be confused by the picture before you of three remarkable women and thinking that's the story here. I'll tell you what I felt sitting here, uh, if I can be so candid. I felt you as mayor are in a remarkable situation because you have on your team two number ones. Thank you. And it is very hard to hold a team together of such extraordinary talented people because you both could lead anything. And I think the choice you've made to instead of separating, but to work together, to be such a talented group is such a testament to you. Thank you. And it's exactly how I feel about my team at the College Board. I think my job number one is to keep the band together, and God bless you. I hope you do, because what you're doing is amazing. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Well done. You're good at this. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. <laughs>